Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to just give you a snapshot of some of the work that we're doing in the center. So if you can uh, uh, strap in, I'm going to move fairly quickly through uh, a lot of the areas that we're trying to um, uh, inspire change in, I suppose, at, 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 uh, at, at policy level, at uh, practitioner level, at student level, um, in, in the sitting room, on the streets, um, uh, in technology, in a number of different areas. Um, so, uh, as Ger said, I'm the uh, Senior ICT Design Advisor with the, the Centre for Universal Design. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly tell you about the remit of the centre, uh, some of the areas we're working in, um, how we try to get other partners motivated, other people motivated around Universal Design, what motivates us, uh, and then the different partnerships that we're working in uh, and working with, the different people we're working with to try and uh, uh, advance this agenda in Ireland. And, and what is the agenda? Well, universal design essentially is the design uh, of environments, buildings, places, products, services, ICT, um, so they can, they can be accessed, understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people regardless of their age, disability, size or ability. Uh, and that's uh, the definition as per uh, Irish law, as per the Disability Act. Uh, and, uh, you know, essentially it's to change everything so it's more usable by everyone. Um, so where do you start with an elephant like this? Uh, well, I suppose we started looking exactly at what the aims are for universal design. Um, and they are essentially to maximize the number of people who can readily use a product, building or service, designing services and environments that are readily usable by most people, um, by making products and services adaptable to different users, um, by having adaptable interfaces, and by having standard interfaces to be compatible with special products, such as assistive technology, as, we'd, as we've heard of, um, from, from Kevin for persons with disabilities. So it is about essentially making environments, products, services just easier to use, um, but by also ensuring that where and if a special interface or a piece of assistive technology needs to be compatible, that it remains compatible with that product environment or service. Um, this is probably the oldest slide I have in my slide deck. I have this probably going back about 10 years now. Um, it, it is essentially trying to convey that there are some uh, uh, requirements, um, some sticks for universal design, um, but there are also many more uh, maybe carrots or, or uh, uh, motivations for, for using universal design. Essentially, the stick is the requirement. As I said, it has become um, uh, part of uh, uh, Irish legislation, which is, you know, unique in the world. Um, we are the only uh, country in the world that have uh, defined uh, uh, universal design and legislation. It's being used in policy in Norway, um, and we're seeing some evidence of it coming, becoming policy in France, but it has been defined in legislation in Ireland. Uh, and again, we're the only country in the world that has, on a statutory footing, a centre for universal design. Um, and increasingly what we're seeing is uh, the result of that is that it's, it's filtering into policy. So we have a national um, uh, 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 building policy which now has as its cornerstone universal design. Not accessibility, you know, um, uh, but rather universal design where it's now becoming, um, I suppose, recognized that everything should be usable by everyone. You know, a common sense approach, but common sense is not so common as they say. So some of the uh, carrots that we talk about with universal design products or environment is that they can be used by more people, that it's much more efficient, that you don't need to go and redevelop something if uh, certain people can't use it, um, but also that it's, it's good publicity. It's a social, socially responsible thing to do, um, and that companies who tend to take this seriously tend to have uh, better customer um, loyalty, uh, return visits and whatnot. Um, so as I say, it's, it's, it's good sense. It's recognized certainly by certain sectors of industry uh, as being good sense, particularly the, the technology uh, area. Um, and Thomas J. Watson from IBM has always said that good design is good business, um, where products that are easy to use 
uh, uh, build uh, a better customer base who are more satisfied. It creates satisfied employees uh, who know that their customers are satisfied. The return on investment um, can be uh, uh, quite high. Um, it tends to get pro better products to market faster, um, and that's through the universal design process that I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, and it prevents 80% of down, um, downstream uh, user requirements not being met. Um, so essentially, it, it, it leads to better profit, profitability. As I mentioned, it is in Irish law. It is also enshrined in international uh, human rights law under the UN um, Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which I presume we're all fairly well versed in, in this room anyway at this stage. Um, and, and that certainly looks at the the main way to improve accessibility is to ensure that everything is more universally designed. Um, and it calls on governments to conduct research and to develop standards in the area of universal design so that it becomes mainstream. Um, and it's also been adopted uh, by Europe, and we have uh, evidence of that through the Council of Europe publication, full participation through universal design. So how do we go about it within the centre? Well, there's basically three areas that we look at. And one area is the area of standards. And myself and my two colleagues, um, I look after the ICT area, and my colleague James looks after product and services, and my uh, colleague Neil looks after the built environment. So we try to influence standards wherever we can, either by initiating the development of new national or international European standards, or by contributing to standards um, uh, to ensure that standards, when they are developed, uh, accommodate, the end result will accommodate the widest range of people possible. And again, one would think that that is de rigueur, that is there already within the development of standards, and quite frankly, it's not. Um, so again, we try to influence standards whenever and wherever we can, and I'll give you a couple of examples of, of some of these in a moment. Um, educational professional development is very important for us. So educating the next generation of students who are product designers, who are architects, who are civil engineers, um, who are software developers, who are web developers coming out of college so that they have a real appreciation of the diversity of users that we have in our society and are able to design not just for themselves but for that diverse range of users. And then we're always trying to, to build awareness of universal design. Um, uh, uh, we would love to see a universal design movement or revolution. Um, that's what we're always trying to um, uh, invoke in our, in our champions and in our partners around universal design. But raising awareness, of course, is always an important thing to do. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of examples of our work in each of the three areas. My area is ICT. And I'll also talk about some of the examples from the built environment area and from products and services. And it's at this point I wish that at the team meetings that we have in the centre that I'd listened to my colleague, colleagues telling me about their projects so I'd be able to talk about them um, uh, now. But I'll, I'll do my best to represent the work that my other colleagues in, in uh, the built environment and products and services areas are doing. I'll start in my own area um, in ICT. Um, and unfortunately, unlike Anders, a lot of the work we do in the area of ICT is around the very mundane technology. It's the everyday technology. And uh, I don't know if any of you are still on the analog service, but I'm sure by now it has been, you've been informed, if not, it's not been rammed down your throat that on the 24th of August, the analog signal is, is being switched off. Um, but in fact, this switch to digital has presented a huge amount of both opportunities and obstacles for people. Um, so in the case of my, my mother, she has four boxes under her television. She has five remotes on the table in front of her, four of which control the volume of the television. One of which, if she turns on, will knock off her RTE reception. And then another, if she turns it on, will give her BBC. She is immensely confused all the time about being able to switch channels, okay? Now, she has a digital setup, but it is very complex. So we are finding that there's quite a lot of confusion out there by very many users about what should be a simple process. Um, and what our research did was to try and find what are the experiences of Irish people, but also what are the experiences of broadcasters like RTE, 
service providers like UPC and manufacturers like Samsung and Dolby and those people in developing product and services that people can actually use. And as you can imagine, it's quite complicated. So what we tried to do here was to put into one place what are the requirements of users, of everyday people, so that digital television um, products and services can be usable and accessible to everyone. Um, so that's, that's, it was the first um, national or international piece of research that actually took a universal design approach to digital television, not just looking at what are the issues around captions or audio description or remote controls, but about everything for everyone. Um, and that is currently available on, on our universal design uh, website. A piece of research we've, we're going on at the moment um, that's just coming to fruition at the moment uh, that is probably of interest to everyone in this room is what are Irish people's experiences in using public sector websites? So how often and when was the last time you were on a public sector website and found the language really confusing or found the form really difficult to fill out or just find that you were having difficulty with it? Or maybe you found it was a really positive experience. Maybe you found that the piece of advice was very well written and it gave you clearly what the rules and what the uh, information and what the next steps were. So currently we're looking at that. Um, the, we have uh, uh, done quite a lot of research, 1,200 people surveyed. We've interviewed about 12 uh, public sector website managers, various uh, end user representative groups. We've interviewed people who actually develop websites in the web development community and that research is going to be published by the end of the year and there's going to be a piece of guidance developed for public sector managers. Um, one other piece of research that we're doing at the moment and don't get too excited about the graphics of robots and um, uh, things like that on the page because actually the piece of research that we're doing is looking at um, pendant alarms and their use by older people and the liberties. So the piece of research we're doing is in partnership with St. James's. We're going to be presenting on it at the Active Age Conference. So as you know, uh, this is the year of, uh, Dublin is the city of science this year. Um, uh, St. James's are holding a, a conference on the 2nd and 3rd of November. And on that Saturday, November the 3rd, there'll be a theatrical demonstration showing what the um, experiences of older people are in using technology particularly looking at this pendant alarm that we're now seeing more and more older people using. Um, again, from a universal design perspective, could the design of these uh, products be any better? Um, uh, and, and also looking at what other technologies older people use and their experiences of those. So again, this research is ongoing. We'll be presenting on it at this conference and afterwards we'll be publishing the research um, and the findings of that. So next in the area of built environment, uh, this year uh, or late last year we published a, a, a large series of technical advice guidance booklets um, called Building for Everyone, um, uh, informing about universal design in the built environment. Again, it's aimed at professionals working in the built environment uh, as well as the general public. Um, it has, uh, so there are 10 booklets covering areas such as uh, the external environment, vertical circulation, building management, um, planning and policy, facilities and buildings. So it's a, it's a revision of uh, guidance that NDA developed um, uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, but this time we're, we've very much taken a universal design approach. So dimensions and references throughout Building for Everyone are based on combined guidance for many of the international standards and guidelines. And rather than giving one dimension, for example, we get, tend to give a range of dimensions um, so that the designs, um, they were not restricting designers, architects, engineers, they were giving them a range of options that they can, um, that they can pick from when designing buildings and environments that are used and accessible to the widest range of people possible. This is available in accessible PDF download. It's also available as a series of 10 booklets. Um, and it's quite a high quality publication. I didn't manage it myself, so I can say that with uh, unbiased opinion, um, with very good images and graphics, um, technical drawings and whatnot, and examples in it. A second project that uh, uh, we're undertaking in the area of built environment is around shared surfaces, shared spaces, 
home zones um, and research and recommendations in that area for, for Ireland. And I need to be very careful because Tom Gray, who was the principal investigator on this piece of research, is sitting in the audience. So just to say a shared space is a street or space designed to improve pedestrian movement and comfort by reducing the dominance of motor vehicles, enabling all users to share the space equally rather than um, following the clearly defined rules implied by conventional designs. How did I do, Tom? Was that okay? Thank you. Um, so essentially, this was a piece of research uh, inspired by, I suppose, an international trend to introduce these shared spaces, um, and also by a trend that we saw locally in local authorities to begin to build areas where both pedestrians and cars were sharing the same space. There may be um, coffee shops within the vicinity, um, you know, these types of plaza and open spaces that are becoming quite, quite popular. Uh, and again, we wanted to look at what are the implications of this from uh, a universal design perspective. This is currently being um, made into an accessible PDF format. Uh, myself and Tom are working on that. It will be available on the NDA website in a, in a matter of weeks. Some other works that we're currently doing in the area of the built environment is, what was that? Five. Okay, four and a half. I won't, I won't draw a breath for the next four minutes. Um, so another piece of work that we're doing in the area of the built environment are draft guidelines for universal design homes in Ireland. Uh, and again, what's, I suppose, interesting in the whole area of, of people's homes is that, um, and, and a little bit like what Anders was, was picking up on earlier, uh, at some point we all become um, disabled to some degree. So 60% um, of new homes being built today are going to be occupied by a person with a disability at one stage. And we can say that because people acquire disability, we can all be temporarily disabled. And as we age into disability, we all develop uh, um, uh, impairments or rather we lose certain functional abilities. So we're looking very carefully at what does this imply for our current housing stock um, and what could be the uh, um, what, what could be the guidance we could provide to inform national policy um, uh, and to inspire practitioners as well to design, build and develop um, universal design homes. These guidelines are currently in draft, they're not available. And one of the reasons they're not available is that we're doing a follow-up study on a cost-benefit analysis as to how much it actually costs to make a home universally designed. What are the payoffs for making a home universally designed, both in terms of you know, satisfaction from the, from the customer's perspective, but also from a societal perspective? What are the wider costs or per perhaps benefits by making homes more usable and accessible to everyone on an ongoing basis. Um, there are just a couple of the, of the, well, there are another couple of pieces of research. So we're doing research recommend, uh, recommendations and design guidance for dementia uh, and home design for Ireland, looking at new build and retrofit homes from a universal design approach. That project is, is currently, the tenders are currently being evaluated for that. Um, we're also doing research on universal design educational campuses across the life cycle. So there are, you know, as you may have heard, uh, potential large developments in the area of third level educational campuses such as Grange Gorman in the, in the pipeline. Um, and we'd like to get in there and develop some research to say here is how we can make this campus as universally designed as possible. Finally, in the area of products and services, I mentioned earlier that we're doing work um, on standards. Um, and the community, the Commission for Energy R Regulation approached us. We have an ongoing relationship and partnership with them um, and was, had written into um, uh, uh, basically their regulation for the energy uh, sector that communications with customers should be uh, universally designed as, as much as possible. Um, so we developed a standard with the NSAI a particular type of standard called a SWIFT, which is a very, I suppose, rapid way of developing a consensus-based document. We worked with the energy regulator. We also worked with the energy suppliers. Um, and that was published within a matter of months. Um, and that provides uh, guidance uh, to uh, energy suppliers, so the ESB, Airtricity, um, and those sorts of companies, um, in order that uh, their communications with customers um, will be uh, essentially better um, uh, and more usable among more people. We've also commissioned a, a large piece of research um, on size. 
Um, and essentially what we were looking for there was uh, what can we say about size in relation to design? So how does size influence design? Um, one of the outputs of that uh, are some very simple fact sheets for designers. So they could be furniture designers, bicycle designers, designers of any types of products or services um, that show what are the anthropometric data that we have for Ireland um, and what does that mean in terms of the design specification. Um, so as I said, there are four fact sheets for designers. Um, we have provided guidance also on how human size impacts on design decisions, but also on procurement. Um, so uh, again, uh, what are the things that organizations need to put into their procurement specifications um, so that uh, product services, um, that sort of thing, are, are going to fit the people that they're designed for. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly go through the last couple of slides. Um, we are also working in partnership with the Institute of Designers in Ireland for an award um, for Universal Design, which is going to be part of the uh, IDI Design Awards 2012. Our area in the work, our work in the area of education is, is, is fairly comprehensive at this stage. Um, on screen are a couple of postdoctoral pieces of research that we're uh, uh, funding, co-funding, uh, sponsoring with uh, the Irish uh, Research Council, uh, previously ERCSET, um, and they cover areas uh, like product design, um, like the built environment, um, uh, and that sort of thing. We're also starting off in secondary schools as well, and we've recently piloted uh, a project called Designing Our Tomorrows um, uh, in conjunction with uh, University of Cambridge and the um, uh, Inclusive Design uh, Research Department there. Um, we're currently uh, working with some who we are hoping to be master trainers um, who will uh, promote uh, this essentially small module for secondary school teachers on design and what are the basics that you need to know about design but also what do you need to take into account when you're designing for other people. Uh, and finally we're developing a module for first years. This we're doing with quite a number of third level uh, educational um, organizations in Ireland such as DIT, um, uh, ITB, um, uh, Cork IT uh, and essentially that's going to be a small module for first year architects, civil engineers, software engineers, product designers, teaching them about universal design um, and the approach that we're taking there or at least one of the approaches is that we're developing a suite of personas um, called the normals um, uh, they've been dubbed in my office the village people, although I don't see the resemblance myself. But essentially, this will be a hook in with first year students to get them to, uh, uh, to start to appreciate that, you know, not everyone has got the same capabilities as themselves. Not everyone has the same abilities. People have diverse ra uh, diverse range of, 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 of uh, requirements. We want to teach them a little bit about creativity, teach them a little bit about this uh, designing for diverse users, uh, teach them a little bit about essentially universal design so that will influence their project work um, and their areas of uh, uh, interest in their, in their studies throughout university. Um, that's, this, that's me. Uh, I'll just leave you with one, one thought provided by my colleague Neil, um, which is that it took 30,000 years to put wheels in a suitcase. Um, but yet, 2012 was the 40th anniversary um, of wheeled luggage. So I guess just because it's obvious doesn't mean that it has been done. Um, just because it makes common sense doesn't mean that it's common. Um, thank you very much for your attention.